you for tuning in to the 2021 Mineral Symposium of the Pacific Northwest Chapter of Friends of Mineralogy. This is our second virtual symposium due to the current health restrictions because of the global pandemic, so we're glad that you could join us here today. Our 2021 theme for this symposium is the Minerals of Africa, and our next speaker is Dr. Demetrius Paul. As a young boy, Demetrius found a topaz crystal while on a family camping trip in New South Wales, Australia. That topaz crystal sparked a lifelong passion for mineral collecting, and he still has that crystal. After a false start in architecture, he switched to geology, earning a PhD in geochemistry from Stanford University. His career yo-yoed between industry and academia with a stint as associate curator at the American Museum of Natural History and teaching at Columbia University. But most of his career was spent in mineral exploration in Australia, South America, and Africa. With college friends, he started his own mineral exploration company focusing on African and South American minerals. He is now retired, restoring old houses, tending to his mineral collection, and he loves traveling with his wife, Chris. This will be an expanded and updated talk of one that Demetrius gave a few years ago to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. It will incorporate Damas Prosquier's recent adventures and Vesalite discoveries. And now here's Demetrius Paul with his talk, Dangers in Long Grass, Mineral Collecting in the Republic of the Congo. Hello, um, I'm very grateful to be here and to be asked to give this talk to the uh, Pacific Northwest chapter of the Friends of Mineralogy. Particularly, I want to thank Bill Dameron, who seemed to have put the word out, and Julian Gray for making it happen. So, um, I've known Bill ever since about 1989, I think, when he was ambassador to Mali. And uh, I was working there for an Australian mining company looking for gold, and we got to know each other. Oddly enough, we'd met, but we never really got to talk until many years after you left Mali and I'd left Mali. And just to introduce myself a little further, I'm an exploration geologist, been working, looking for uh, gold, precious metals, copper, zinc, basically anything we can make a buck out of for the last 65 years. And, uh, well, that's a little bit much, about 55 years. Uh, and uh, I've worked mainly in Australia, South America, and Africa, and probably the last 25 years in Africa. So uh, I got to first visit uh, the Congo Republic in 1976 when I was traveling with another geologist looking at ore deposits in Africa and collecting minerals along the way. Uh, I used to trade minerals with Jim Manette at that point and ship him, make shipments of minerals from Africa. They would eventually arrive at Jim's place and Jim would keep what he wanted and flog the rest for him. Uh, then, and so in about March, 1976, we arrived in Congo, which was just, uh, at that point, uh, a Marxist, uh, a nominally Marxist state, having been in uh, uh, Zaire, Mobutu Zaire, which is now the DRC next door, uh, also looking at mines and minerals. We arrived in, uh, in Brazzaville, crossing the river on a canoe, uh, the ferries being down at the time, and took the train from uh, Brazzaville to Minduli and then on to Mpasa and finally on to, po uh, to Point Noir. And along the way, we stopped at the Mpasa mine, and uh, which was still operational in those days, and managed to tell a geologist there, or sort of work with the geologist there, and find him a new small calcasite deposit. 
uh, and uh, we'll get to that again later. And then I returned to the Republic of the Congo in, I think it was 2012, and started an exploration program looking for copper until 2016. So we spent almost five years uh, looking for copper mineralization in the, in the Congo Republic before we decided it wasn't worth the candle. Along the way, I managed to visit a few places and collect a few minerals. And with that, I'll just sort of fill you in on those adventures. And I, at this point too, I'd like to thank uh, Steve Olson, who provided most of the graphics, and Thomas Prashika, who, Prashkia, who I um, sort of imparted what little knowledge I had of Congo, and he went and took it and ran with it. So with that, without further ado, I'll just go on to the presentation. Well, this, is, this presentation is really about my mineral collecting adventures and a little bit about the geology of the Republic of Congo and where minerals are found. Uh, I want to correct something I said earlier. I actually was in Congo in 2010, just looking at the, the dates. Now, there are two Congos. Uh, the big blob in the middle of your screen, right in the middle of Africa, is the Democratic Repu uh, Republic of Congo. It used to be Zaire under Mobutu. The purple on the map of Africa is the Republic of Congo. And on the left, on the right here, we have a geological map. And the bit that we're really interested in is this light green colored material down in here. This is the Neoproterozoic, these are Neoproterozoic rocks which host all the uh, copper and lead mineralization in the Congo and the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. So, so the, the Republic of Congo has been known by that name since August 15th, 1960. It was always part of French West Africa. Uh, the first was, uh, was the French Congo, then the Middle Congo in French Equatorial Africa, and then the Republic of Congo as a department of France. Colloquially, it's known as Congo, Congo Brazzaville, Congo B. But Google gets it wrong all the time. You, look, you search for stuff on Google in the uh, Republic of Congo and it will bring up stuff in the DRC. It's equatorial, it lies between four degrees north and five degrees south. Uh, and it's on the western banks of the Ubangi and Congo rivers and stretches to the Atlantic. It's about 450 miles north-south and 400 miles east-west. Northern part of the country is all equatorial rainforest. The southern part has been logged and is now mostly savanna grassland with relic rainforest. It's got a population of about five and a quarter million, and it's about twice the size of Washington state. Uh, it's had uh, the same president since about 1971, a gentleman by the name of Sasu Ngueso. And this is him at the... Um, 50th anniversary of independence in 2010. And this is in Brazzaville. So 1960 became independent and the government declared it was going to be scientific socialism and established relationships with China, Vietnam, North Korea, and the Soviet Union. It was nominally Marxist, just like the country across the river, Zaire was nominally capitalist. Both of them were kleptocracies. Um, in 1968, there was a coup and a declaration of the People's Republic of Congo, which became even more Marxist. And then there was, uh, the president was assassinated in 1977, and then Sassou Nguesso becomes president. He's been president ever since. Um, there was a 1997 civil war which destroyed much of the capital. And the war is basically between the southern and northern political parties, which are ethnically based. After the Civil War, uh, and Gueso, uh, Sasso and Gueso decided that probably capitalism was a better model than Marxism, but uh, it's still a kleptocracy. 
2002, there was another civil war between the North and the South. And the Southern rebels are largely based in a tribe around Minduli called the Umjars, commonly known as the Ninjas. And 2016, 2017, they rebelled again, and there's been ongoing tension. So they put up um, roadblocks on the road and sort of collect irregular taxation from anyone going through pool department. And every now and the government steps in and sends some soldiers in there to try and clear them out, works for a little while, and life goes on. Um, all the collector minerals are found in the area of the box down in the bottom here of the geological map. It's part of the West Congolian fold belt. The rocks are 800 to 1200 million years old and consist of shelf carbonates and uh, sandstones and mudstones, mostly carbonate. And they're overlain by sandstones or uh, early uh, Phanerozoic sandstones. The rocks themselves are equivalent to the copper belt rocks of uh, the DRC and Zambia. And there are numerous small copper lead zinc deposits and shows throughout this region. But most of them are small and only a few mines have ever actually produced any significant amounts of ore. This is a geological map of the area and it shows you from the extreme northwest up uh, northeast up here is Renneville, and then all the major little shows and mineralization that occurs goes all the way to Boko Songo uh, in the uh, southwest. The area sort of is in these rocks called the Shisto Calcare, uh, and it's part of the Empioca group. And they're overlain by these sandstones of the Nkisi group. And I just want you to keep those two facts in mind. All the mineralization occurs in carbonates uh, along this major fault system, which runs north, east, southwest. And then there's a splay fault system that runs again through Mfuati along the drainage valley of the uh, Niari River. And you can see everywhere there's a bunch of uh, mines and mineralization, but Renneville, Minduli, Mubiri, Hapilo, Mfuati, Yanga Kubenza and Palabanda, Bokuzengo, and Mpasa were the only places that actually produced, had any active mining on them. The rest are really just prospects. So the, the history is fairly, long and, uh, but the main part is that the, a Dutch company first uh, exploited the oxide ores of uh, Minduli in around 1900. And that was followed from 1909 to 1913 by a Societe de Mines de Dewey, which mined the oxide at Runneville. And that was about really the only thing that ever happened at Runneville. Um, until 1950, when Wayne Burnham went there and collected four crates of dioptase. Um, 1911, Minduli was put into operation. 1929, the Mpasa mine, which is a calcocyte mine mainly, calcocyte and sphalerite, uh, was, uh, went underground. And then in 1938, the uh, M. Fuadi began mining. 1939, prior to the war, operations ceased at Minduli and haven't really started again. In 1978, Mpasa closed. And in 2006, a, a consortium of New Yorkers, New York uh, financiers, and a Ukrainian oil company applied for and got the exploration license for everything from Mpasa to, um, to, uh, to Boko Zongu, a, a very big license, about 3,000 square kilometers. 
and started to mine at Bokusongu. Uh, they were um, they mined at Bokusongu for about two years and realized that there is nothing underneath it. These are superficial oxide deposits. And there've been other small operations, uh, exploration companies, my own included, Sanu Resources. Uh, the, in 2008, the Societe Lulu, a Chinese company, attempted to mine Minduli uh, illegally. They had an exploration license and were not allowed uh, and tried to sort of fill all the oxide ore into containers and ship it out and were told they couldn't do that. Then that in 2014, Chinese investors took over the uh, license of, uh, of uh, the covered M40. And then it recently, the same company activated the, uh, reactivated the Mpasa mine. And that produced, I think, just this year or late last year, produced some fairly spectacular copper sites again. During our exploration, we came across these early uh, the remains of old copper smelters. This is a, a, a clay a retort, the base of a clay retort furnace. It probably stood about five or six feet high and was used to melt oxide uh, copper. And these bangles that you see here are called Manila money and were the currency that was used in trading with slavers uh, in West Africa prior to the colonial times or at the beginning of colonial times. So uh, Burnham's, here's a letter from Burnham in uh, who shipped out four crates of diopters. He spent a week uh, at, uh, at Runneville. It took him about four days to get there, about three days to get back. And he spent about five miserable days paying the locals to dig diopters for him and shipped four crates out in 1950. The diopters from uh, Renneville is really quite distinctive. It occurs in these nodules, usually in planchiate, in this dark gray black so uh, soil called terre noir. It's a manganese rich, basically it's about 20% uh, manganese oxide and it forms a cast fill and sufficient uh, deposit in the area. And this is what was the ore at Renneville. This is my exploration crew here, Steve Olson on the left. So the whole area that we're looking at isn't that far. Hongo Brasserville is here, and you see this big blob in the, in the Landsat image. This is what is the Congo pool, after which the department of pool in, uh, in the Congo is named. Kinshasa is on one side of the river in the DRC. Brasserville is on the other. It's about three kilometers across the river. And to get from Brasserville to Renneville, you go to Kinkala, about 70 kilometers, and then another 70 kilometers to Renneville. In 2010, it was quite a feat to get from Brazzaville to Kinkala and to uh, Renneville. It's another 60, 60 kilometers from Kinkala to Minduli, and another 80 kilometers or so or less, just a little under 80 kilometers to Umfuati. You can see this reentrant of the DRC here. The mineralization actually occurs also in this part of uh, the DRC. So getting out of uh, out of uh, Brazzaville is a real is one giant traffic jam for about 15 miles. It, it can take you an hour and a half to two hours just to get out of town. And once you cross this bridge, which is uh, the Jue River, you the Jue River, if you go up the Jue River, followed to its headwaters, you end up at Renneville. But you have to go the long way around these days. And the road, this is the Route Nationale. This is the main road between Brazzaville and Pointe Noire in 2010. It was about a two lanes road and dirt all the way. It used to take 
somewhere in the order of uh, three hours to get to Kinkala and another three to four hours to get to Mindoli from there. So, sorry. And then at Kingala, you, it's about, you take a hangar right and try to find the road to Renneville. And this is the, the road has not improved. It's still like this. Um, and notice here on the, this right-hand picture that the, tr the road surface is about a meter below the surface of the soil. This is this loose, degraded sandstone, and the road cuts itself down. So in the wet season, this is you're spinning your wheels in mud, and in the dry season, you're spinning your wheels in sand. It's a, a tough road. And along the way, it, the road gets completely overgrown. Here's one of our guys looking for it. And occasionally you have problems, like the locals set fire to the grass and you might be stuck in the middle of it. It's a bit of an issue. And eventually you get to Renneville, uh, which is about a dozen mud huts, about five kilometers from the mine. And then you cross up a ridge and then you look down on the mine area, which is down in this part of the valley down here. And the Indus open cut is just down in here. The old mine dumps are just in the trees. And this is a sort of a panorama we constructed to show all the different little copper showings over about a three kilometer area uh, in this valley. The Indus open cut was the only active mine. There were a few pits, prospecting pits, that were dug in various other places where there was mineralization. This is the Indus open pit. It's all of about 170 meters long. And this is what we call Dioptes Creek. You could find copper stained boulders with, and you could wash Dioptes out of the, the pan Dioptes out of the sand in the creek. And here is sort of a sketch map of the structure of the area. The pink rocks are all the, the Lucala group, which is the carbonate section of the, of this, the, of the host rocks. And then the green rocks, are the Empioca, which is a fairly hard sandstone. But notice this boundary up here between the light green and the dark green. I'll come back to this later. This is the overlying Phanerozoic sandstone, which is, uh, I think, plays an important part in the mineralization. You usually find, as you go at that junction between the Phanerozoic and the Neoproterozoic, you see these gravel beds, or these pebble beds. And these pebble beds are the site of Neolithic uh, flint factories. And you find, arrowheads and uh, axe heads and all kinds of stuff always here, but they're always on top of hills. The underlying carbonate section is stromatolytic, usually thin bedded, very typical. And here's a model of the, what the, we think the mineralization looks like. This is a cross section through m And notice m is at the top of a hill. And the, we have the ore deposits are formed in casts at the top of the hill, which are related to faults. And then there's other kinds of mineralization also related to faults, which then often form lenses along the fault of higher grade mineralization. And the mineralization is often in fractures and sometimes bleeds as disseminated mineralization into sandstones. And this is national route number one between Kingali, uh, Kingali, uh, Kingala and Minduli at, uh, in 2012. In 2019, when Thomas was there, it's become a four-lane blacktop and you can do it in 40 minutes. Uh, this is the town of Minduli. 
And one of the things that you notice about Minduli is that there are three cell towers. Capitalism at work. There are three competing cell phones. And believe it or not, I think you have better cell phone coverage and service in the Republic of Congo than you do in the United States. <laughs> the speeds are higher and you get it everywhere, <laughs> even in remote little villages. And the reason is they put up these 300 foot towers. Now in 2010, and I, I don't think in 2014, it hadn't changed. Um, you can see the, whoops, sorry. You can see the results of the civil war. This is the railroad station at Minduli. This is the town hall, the market in Minduli, and this is uh, the road to our office in Minduli. So it, it's a very small, basic subsistence level town relying entirely on agriculture. And the odd expression company comes in and pays a few people extra. This is the, uh, the Minduli mine, the open cut. On the right, you have one of the partners in our little exploration company, John Lucking, looking at the mineralization. And you can see that this is all oxide mineralization in the surface. There's very little uh, sulfide. And it turns out the drilling underneath this thing has not found anything. And Minduli produced dioptase. It produced wolfenite. It produced native silver. As you can see here, this is a, a little crystalline piece of native silver that we washed, uh, panned out of the, a, a stream draining Minduli. The other thing that you find commonly in the lateritic soils around Minduli are big pods of manganese uh, pyrolusite, very high grade. And occasionally you find soils which will run all grade silver. They'll run sort of 50, 60, 180 grams per ton silver. Uh, this is what got us very excited until we found out there were no legs underneath it. And exploration crews have to eat. So you eat local. And this is uh, my field manager who was responsible for the cooking. This is my geologist, uh, La Sin. And this is our restaurant. And you can have bouillon de beef soup. You can have agouti soup, which is whoops, is this small animal that's hanging down from this guy's hand. And you can have, um, uh, this is this is a goodie, this is beef. You can have snake soup, or you can have fried widgety grubs. So it's, with, it's food is pretty basic. I consider it fuel, not food. And uh, so from Minduli, the next place, uh, sort of the next closest occurrence is Mubiri, which uh, Tomak, uh, Tomas uh, Fashkir ended up uh, mining. And we'll go there and have a look at uh, what that looks like. Oh, sorry, I'm going to go to the Impasa mine first, because this one was, uh, an, I have a particular relationship to this. We showed up here. And there was a young geologist who was having a great deal of trouble because he had about a week's worth of oil left. And you'll notice that these little pods in here, there's a little, these little extensions coming out of the main fault zone, they seem to be fairly evenly spaced. Well, out over here is the soccer field. And we looked at these things and said, look, they're all about. 200 yards apart. Why don't we drill a hole in the soccer field? And sure enough, we found some calcazite mineralization. He was a happy camper. Uh, but it so it took him another two years to mine out that pod, apparently. And Mpasa is famous for its calcasite crystals. This was one in the uh, Carnegie, uh, no, in the University of Paris. It's 30 centimeters across a five centimeter crystal belonging to Peter Haas. And this is, these are calcocytes that came out probably early this year or late last year from Impasa. And this piece is about 12 centimeters across. Um, 
Crystal Classics has them now. And early on, a few years ago, there were a lot of um, diopteses that were coming from an area we're usually given the name Kimbedi or Kimbanga. And Kimbanga is actually a series of prospects that includes the Impita, the Songo one, and the Songo two. And they're in silicified dolomites. It's just a prospect. And this is Dominique Katona, who works in the patrol. Is a, he works in the uh, oil fields at Point Noir. But when he comes home, he lives about five miles down the road. He goes and digs diaptase, and he got some very fine ones from this. He's moved all of this by himself. Uh, and it's, it's really hard siliceous rock, very impressive mining. And this is some of the, this is typical of some of the things he gets, the planchiate with uh, scattered diaptase. And these are some of the things. This is a truly interesting specimen that came from, uh, from Songo. Uh, the area across this picture is probably four inches. And these tan areas are girtite replacements of dioptase, an earlier generation of dioptase. And these are mentioned in Dana as typical of material from Ronneville, which suggests that Dana got it wrong. Um, this is an aerial view of the Sander Hills. This is the next area that uh, sort of heading southwest from Mindouli. And you can see trenches up here and this wooded area down here. One of the, this area here is sort of generically called Sander. The locals call this area Pimbi, and this is Sander. Um, and this is the adit that was cleaned up uh, down the bottom of the gully down here by Tomash, and he mined some spectacular um, diaptase from here. And so anything that you see with a name like Xander or Pimby comes from this area. And this is typical, not typical, these are spectacular pieces from here. This is about an inch and a half tall, a cerusite with a diaptase uh, that was from the, the sander workings. This is typical of the surface exposures up on the hill. You get sort of druzy quartz with little wolfenites and these little sort of thumbnail, not much bigger than that usually, uh, diaptase. But when they went into the attic, at, uh, they ended up getting some truly spectacular quartz and diaptase specimens. And this is the, the road into the, the, sand, the Entola mine, which is a little further down, uh, about another 20 kilometers down the road. And the mine here produced these Um, epimorphs after an unknown mineral, probably planchiate, may have been shatterkite, but shatterkite hasn't been identified in the Congo as far as I know. These are two specimens that uh, Thomas uh, collected. This is a typical one of these epimorphs with small mimetites underneath it here. So we've been to Mindili, we've been to Mubiri, We've been to Mpasa, Kimbedi, and Kimbedi, as you notice, note is on the, the road, and uh, on the main road, so you have to go to Sander. The occurrence, the Impeta mine is about where my pointer is at the end of the, the hammer. And now we're going to go down, follow the road down to, from here, follow the main road and go to Palabanda and then to Umfuati take a side excursion to Ngudi, uh, Ngwedi, sorry, and then to Bokusonga. So Palabanda was uh, a small open pit that was opened up by Suremi 
uh, in about 2009. And they mined a little bit of oxide ore. They got a lot of hemimorphite uh, in this mine. Uh, the blue in here is the hemimorphite and basiliite find. The green is where malachite and cerusite came from in the pit. This is a hemimorphite from the Palabanda uh, open pit. This is a, 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 a combination of basiliite. This is about 13 centimeters across basiliite. The sort of crusty mid blue color in here is capuchite overgrowing both the celliite and hemimorphite. And the pale blue is hemimorphite. And if you get a lens on this specimen, you see little pale green dots in here, blue green dots, which are zincolabethanite. This was a, a spectacular find by, uh, by Thomas. And these are the malachites and cerusites that came out of the same pit. They got some even bigger ones and they're very pretty little snowflakes on velvet malachite. This is the road. The road comes down this canyon from Palabanda is just on the other side of that hill, comes up this canyon and then goes into Mfuati. This is downtown Mfuati. And the first time I visited, it was a four hour drive from Minduli uh, in uh, 2010. And I arrived in town and I asked one of these kids, you know, how do you get to, this is the Mfuati Hill in behind you. And I asked one of these kids in here, you know, where can I find some minerals? And one of them said, we have a mineral dealer. And you go, what? <laughs> And the mineral dealer is Jeremy Calais. Uh, also, uh, he has a local name, uh, a, a Bakonga name of Nkola. But he goes by Jeremy Calais. He used to be the storeman at the Bokosongo mine. And while the Bokosongo mine was going, there was a Chilean geologist, and he sort of showed Calais the dioptase that was coming out of Boca Zongo at the time. And Calais thought there was money here. He got in touch with a, a mineral dealer in Pointe Noire and through that mineral dealer, they had an arrangement with Bryce Gobang and a couple of others, which uh, was sort of, a difficult arrangement, shall we say. <laughs> Lots of material sort of went sideways. And I introduced Thomas to Jeremy because Jeremy has, hires crews of local people to dig holes for him in the various like, localities and collect minerals. And so Thomas and uh, Calais had an arrangement and every time I talk to Thomas about it, he sort of makes a shooting motion against his head. Um, but he did get some good specimens. This is an aerial shot of M40 that taken by Thomas's crew. And you can see this hill of silicified uh, karstic limestone up in here. The town, main town is a little to your right but it's quite spread out. And there are adits through this hill that you can go through. And the main mineralization occurs at the West End in here, where you get um, the red wolfenites. Up at this end, you get some uh, dioptase, but always very small and very poorly adhering to matrix. Sometimes they occur with small, um, orange wolfenites and at this end and at the east end you get a lot of cerusite and hemimorphite it's largely a lead deposit with some zinc and has only really got accessory uh, copper with it so here you can see the everything 
that was in these holes between these ridges of silicified and sheer dolomite, uh, sheer limestone, was mined out. And it was all material called Ternois, this mangan, this friable manganese oxide, which contained oxidized uh, lead and uh, copper minerals and zinc minerals. You can see this here is dioptase knob. The dioptase is found at the base of the, in, in a hole at the base of that knob. This is the, the mine itself sort of had a very difficult life. It was never successful. Um, the high manganese content makes it extremely difficult to treat. And this is the remains of a uh, Bulgarian Soviet era mine that was in place. It is no longer there. It's been taken away for scrap. Um, it ceased operations, I think, in 1978, something like that. But in the holes that uh, Jeremy has been digging, this is a, a hole in the east end. You can see these quite large patches of fairly spectacular cerusite specimens that are pulled out. And they're very, they, here, he's, this is Jeremy here. This is his crew digging in one of these terroirs, one of these um, black dirt, <laughs> really is what it is, black ground areas at the west end where the um, red wolfenites come from. And so these are typical of the wolfenites from there. This one is about an inch and a half. This one is 9.5 centimeters across, so better than four inches. These are about three, three and a half centimeters. Now that this is a, a four centimeter wolfenite with a quartz coating. This one's about three centimeters. This one's about uh, four centimeters across. They get very large ones, but most of them are small. The cerusites from there can be very, very good, but they're usually corroded, not always. You can see the etching happening on this here. These are pieces that were collected by uh, uh, Tomash's crew in the, in the collecting over the last three years. These are a couple of the pieces. This is a, a um, Lauren Thomas piece. This is a piece that um, Tomash has. This is a cerusite. This is about five centimeters, the cerusite, memetite, hemimorphite. This little V-shaped uh, stars or, or of cerusite, memetite, very little uh, hemimorphite on this one. Uh, other minerals that you get at Mfuadi are vanadinite. These are two thumbnails that I got there. Hedifane, which is a sort of a carbonate, um, phosphate of lead, whoops, a carbonate phosphate of lead. And this occurs in the central area where you get these very small three or four millimeter long dioptase crystals. It's coating a very corroded um, cerusite crystal. Here is another, this is pyromorphite, could be hedophane. It's been identified as pyromorphite, but I'm not sure if they've done the chemistry on it. It's uh, very nice little uh, pyrom uh, that I got from um, a cerusite uh, group that I got from uh, Jeremy. Smithsonite is pretty rare, but it does occur in sort of fat dog tooth, uh, sort of rhombohedral crystals, and these sort of wheat sheaf little bundles, and mostly white. No, I have never seen any other colors. And hemimorphite is very common. It occurs in lots of habits. These are crusts of hemimorphite, crystals about a centimeter on a corroded black cerusite. Black cerusite is very, very common. This is a little mimetite crystal here. And this here is a big cr a crust of hemimorphite on a very large, this is about 20 centimeters across here, uh, cerusite. Uh, crystal. The hemimorphite varies from colorless, but the best ones are blue. These, and occasionally you get thick crusts of it. This piece here is about eight centimeters across. 
So that's about a three, four centimeter thick crust. And uh, that was uh, sort of used as cutting material. This material came out about in 2015, I think, 2014. And willamite is very, very common. It's the main zinc ore at Mfuati. A lot of what people call silicification at uh, Umfuati is in fact just dolomite altered to willamite, massive willamite, and occasionally it opens up into these stalactitic brown masses of small crystals, and occasionally you'll find a specimen which will have discrete willamite crystals. This is about five centimeters across, little mimetite crystals. And this is me packing up my, my, the loot at one of my shopping trips down there. I could only go in the weekends. I was busy using other people's money when I was doing exploration, and so I couldn't spend a lot of time collecting minerals. So we're now going to go to Nguedi. To get to Nguedi, you have to actually go all the way back up here, go to Luteti, and come around. There's a fairly high mountain range in here, and no, you can walk or you can drive, which takes you about two hours. Uh, and Gwedi is, again, way at the top of the mountain, up behind this ridge up here. Thomas made the trek up. And these are the typical dioptases that come from there. And they, they're opaque and slightly milky looking and quite distinct. And I've seen these as being attributed to everywhere from Ronneville to, um, to Minduli, to Mfuati, but they, I think they all come from Nguedi. And Bokusongo, finally, Bokusongo was, it used to be a hole in the ground. It's uh, been backfilled in part. It's a small open pit. It produced some spectacular um, dioptases, things as sort of as long as your thumb and not quite as thick. Um, if you look in the article by Wendell and myself on Mfuati, there's pictures of uh, dioptases, and I noted in those that I doubt that any of those dioptases came from Mfuati. Some of them came from Bokusongu, and some of them probably came from Pimbi and Sundra, uh, and, um, and uh, Kimbedi. So heading back to Brazzaville, which is not there you always have to do your obeisance to the ministries, the customs people to get your permit to export the minerals. You have to go and find them in this tower. Often the elevator doesn't work, so you have to walk up 12 floors. This is the Ministry of Mines, which you have to visit before and after every visit. But uh, in spite of a, sort of the chaotic nature of Brazzaville, it's actually quite a pleasant town. And this is a view across the pool at, on the Congo River, which is this sort of five, 10 kilometer wide embayment in the Congo River, a big lake effectively, before it goes down to the coast through the rapids. And you can see the ministry tower over here. The gray skies that you see is the humidity. The tropics are sort of known for their white skies and sort of misty appearance. It's just humidity. And then the Congo comes out of pool, constricts and goes down the rapids. They're probably about a quarter of a mile wide and they are an enormous set of rapids that just go, the entire volume of the Congo River rushes down through here. And, uh, and the amazing thing is, that people get in here and with dugouts and fish from these things. Here's a fishing pole that you can see down he here and fish for um, uh, a Nile perch, which is can grow up to about four or five feet long, very good eating fish. And this little picture here is the confluence of the Jue which comes from Ronneville and the Congo River in the background. And it's a popular spot for the locals to spend the weekends. In the dry season, 
There are lots of sandy beaches, swimming holes, and people set up open air restaurants. And it's actually quite a pleasant place to visit. And with that, I'll leave it. You've got um, some interesting reading. I said everybody should go to the Spire for Sight and read about Thomas's adventures uh, in his dig over the last sort of 2019 and 2020, 2020 uh, in, in Congo. And this is our article on the Mfuwabi mine. And with that, I'll leave it. Thank <laughs> you.